So I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Jian Kang here today. Uh, Dr. Kang is a professor of biostatistics at the University of Michigan. Before joining UMich, he was a faculty member at Emory University. He got his PhD from UMich Biostatistics as well. Uh, his main research interests are developing statistical methods and theory for large scale complex biomedical data analysis with focus on Bayesian methods, method learning, imaging, statistics, and precision medicine. Uh, it was mentioned that Dr. Kang has been elected as the fellow of the so now let's welcome our speaker. Thanks for a nice introduction, and uh, uh, yeah, it's 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 great my pleasure uh, to be here to talk about my recent research, and uh, uh, so this is uh, uh, motivated by the uh, analysis of the neuroimaging data. So. Uh, so basically, neuroimaging it uh, refers to a variety of uh, techniques that uh, directly or indirectly measure the brain functions or structures, and this technique has been uh, like uh, uh, exposed uh, explosive uh, development during the past uh, decades, and uh, it uh, actually becomes uh, non-invasive, uh, a lot of non-invasive technology, and it's very safe, and you can uh, uh, stable uh, measure the brain activity and. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, like uh, like there are typical modalities like EEG, like uh, uh, PET and uh, and uh, uh, so this actually generates a large scale of the uh, data and uh, pose uh, kind of opportunity and challenges for the uh, data scientist uh, and uh, the. The, the, the data structures uh, can be slightly different, but basically it's uh, uh, spatial temporal uh, data that uh, uh, have a common data structures like uh, uh, so it's um, massive data uh, sets. The spatial resolutions for like fMRI data like uh, can be like uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of voxels in a standard green template. And uh, uh, we uh, also that uh, we collect uh, the uh, scan at a different uh, time points. And uh, for like a UG, they can uh, have a very high sampling rate, like one second, they can sample 1,000 time points. And uh, uh, the, the feature, uh, we capture the important feature of the brain structure for brain functional activities that uh, due to the uh, intrinsic property of the brain tissues, the, the, the uh, activation may appear to in the uh, different uh, brain regions. And they may have the contiguous uh, uh, signals, may have the sharp change uh, edge, so uh, jumps. And uh, uh, it's a complicated uh, pattern, and uh, they also appear to vary uh, complicated spatial uh, correlations or temporal correlations, and it can be the neighborhood uh, correlations uh, and uh, in the local uh, high correlations in spatial locations may also have a long range uh, correlation between different uh, brain regions because that uh, is related to brain anatomic structures. And uh, uh, so the, uh, there are several uh, large neuroimaging studies uh, uh, going on and uh, I kind of collect more and more data. So uh, like uh, uh, here are a few examples of the, the autism brain imaging uh, data exchange studies, the applied studies. This is a, a consortium effort is collect uh, data from uh, 17 international, uh, international sites and they, in, they, uh, they collect like structural imaging and uh, resting state FMI and uh, the sample size around Thousands. And uh, also, there's a human connection project, uh, which is uh, uh, collect the multi model imaging like uh, uh, MRI data, fMRI, and uh, uh, EEG, MEG, and, and also around the scale of the sample set around uh, 1200. And uh, also, there are uh, re more recently, there are longitudinal studies like uh, 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 ABCD studies, adolescent brain cognitive development study, which is uh, uh, and try to uh, measure the uh, brain development and the chair health and in the US. And they also, this is also a consortium effort across like 21 uh, research sites and also uh, collect the multi model imaging and uh, collect over time. That's uh, start from 2016 and they, they plan to collect data over uh, 10 years. And uh, uh, and the, the largest, uh, uh, the largest uh, multi model imaging study, maybe the, the UK Falcon data set, maybe you, uh, you, you maybe uh, heard of this for like a, a large scale genetic study. They put a million of the uh, uh, samples that uh, look at the genetic data, but the imaging data also they, they claim like the, the largest uh, uh, imaging study is like uh, they, they, they plan to collect like over uh, 100,000 uh, data. So 
uh, when we have a, a large data set they, they, uh, and uh, uh, how to extract uh, uh, information from those type of large data set, that poses uh, a lot of like uh, uh, problems and issues like uh, for the statistician. And uh, uh, I, here I'm summarize some like uh, uh, basic uh, uh, objective of, uh, maybe I need to, okay. Uh, like objectives of the uh, neuroimaging studies like uh, um, uh, one uh, uh, common objective is uh, activation studies, basically trying to determine brain regions uh, where are more active and uh, how the brain activity associated with some covariance like uh, uh, gender, age, or like uh, disease status. So that is uh, uh, activation studies. And uh, uh, also there are some core activation or connectivity studies that try to uh, study the interrelationship between the uh, brain activation regions or uh, study the brain uh, connectivity patterns for cognitive or functional quantity to understand the brain networks. And also, uh, there are uh, uh, a huge of interest uh, of the, uh, carry out the prediction or classification analysis that try to use brain imaging as a useful biomarker to uh, predict the, the like disease status or uh, predict the, the treatment response. And uh, um, and there are uh, statistical uh, problems like meta-analysis. So I think uh, uh, there are a lot of like uh, experiments uh, done from different institutes. They, they they target the same problem, but uh, usually they, they don't have a, a very large funding that, that only collect the samples like, like uh, 20 to 100 subjects uh, to the same imaging studies. Then they how to uh, combine the results from the independent performed studies at the uh, 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 meta-analysis. And there's also a uh, 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 interesting statistical topic. And also, uh, more recently, as I mentioned before, there's a large scale studies to actually collect uh, different modalities like uh, uh, structural imaging and functional imaging, uh, MRI, PET, or EEG. So, how you actually combine different modalities and uh, uh, do the data integration and uh, uh, also um, a kind of draw the uh, useful uh, uh, kind of conclusion. And so, so today I'm going to actually uh, talk about uh, some traditional. Uh, statistical uh, models that are uh, how we actually address some, some of those questions. So uh, I will, uh, if I have time, hopefully, I, 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 basically I will talk about three different problems. So one is uh, image on scalar regression, uh, uh, another is uh, uh, scalar on image regression, and also uh, if I have time, I will talk about the image on image regression, basically address different problems. So it's, uh, image on scalar regression try to uh, do activation studies, basically identify which part of the brain associated with certain uh, covariates. And uh, scalar on image regression is a prediction problem. So, and uh, it's try to uh, construct a useful prediction model using brain image and uh, predict the clinical status or treatment response. And the image on image regression is more like multi-model imaging uh, kind of uh, analysis. They're trying to uh, uh, study uh, whether one one modality of imaging can predict another modality of imaging and uh, and uh, uh, help us to understand the the brain uh, signal and the um, activity mechanism. So, uh, so all, all this really uh, uh, regression analysis that has been done using like a traditional statistical method. If you think about it, like a like an image on scalar or scalar image, you can do the regular regression analysis, linear regression. You can actually achieve uh, uh, some of the goal. And uh, uh, but uh, today I'm going to uh, talk about some of my recent work on how to use like a uh, uh, to help us to uh, uh, improve uh, sort of statistical inference and. Uh, uh, and also kind of provide a more accurate uh, like a prediction and the model fitting. So, so this is uh, the the uh, the idea uh, that how but but there are three different uh, sort of aspects to apply the uh, deep neural network for these three different models that I will basically go through uh, um, that later. So the first uh, uh, the first uh, uh, kind of topic that is uh, scalar uh, image on scalar regression. So, uh, this, uh, uh, the title of this uh, paper is the uh, image in response regression. We are deep neural network. This is a joint work my, uh, with my former student uh, David Zhang, who is now in in UK as a postdoc, and uh, my my collaborator Le Xinli and uh, uh, Zhang Zhang. Um, so, so this idea is trying to uh, fit these. Uh, Traditional image on scalar regression model using uh, like a, and also using deep neural network help us to do the uh, feature selection and the estimation. So the setup is uh, like this: we have this uh, data set. You can see. Uh, suppose we have n uh, observations and uh, uh, the imaging measurements. Um, 
represented by this uh, yi of sv and uh, uh, sv is the uh, locations uh the the, the imaging uh measurements at a brain location for uh, one of the brain locations and uh, uh we have a set of covariates right so the uh, here we use, uh, have a j capital j covariance and uh, the the regular model uh for this type of analysis is uh, uh consider the image as response the yi of s v as a response and we have a set of covariates we try to do the uh, regression analysis and uh, uh, regress on the x i j j from uh, one to capital j and uh, the uh, uh, so th this we call is a uh, uh, the beta beta of s is a uh, one well of the parameters of interest that we call it a main effect and we also have this alpha i of s uh, which is a uh, uh, individual effect so basically uh, i index uh, subject so for each subject you have a, a, a individual effect alpha i uh, which is a uh, um, uh, which basically ca uh, capture the deviation from the main effect, right? So, uh, individual deviation from the main effect. And then we also have this, uh, residual term, the, the, the epsilon i of, uh, s. So, um, so, th uh, this, uh, this assumption here, we, we have made a, a slight different assumption than the regular model, uh, here, uh, yeah, if you, uh, there is an existing work uh, called a spatially value coefficient model, then uh, it's very natural you assume this alpha of V as a uh, uh, random effects. So, but here we assume that is a fixed effect. So, which is the, this is a, uh, uh, there's a, a true function of alpha I for each subject. Um, and, uh, and the, the difference here, we are trying to uh, argue that this alpha I of S V actually can be estimated. So, uh, uh, so basically, uh, we can be, uh, uh, accurately recover uh, uh, under a certain assumption. And um, and uh, uh, we also uh, allow the uh, random noise term here, which is a uh, uh, regular assumption, it's mean zero, and uh, the variance of the random noise actually is spatially dependent. So at different location, you expect uh, the random noise may be different. So that's uh, uh, another sort of challenge uh, 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 kind of assumption here that make your you know, inference a little bit challenging that you, you don't have the constant allowance over space. So, and uh, and so the uh, key assumption in this model that we uh, we assume the the beta uh, the the parameter of interest the beta of we and the alpha alpha here I stack all the individuals. So suppose you have an individual, so you have a vector of the spatial value coefficient. Uh, alpha and also this uh, spatial evaluating noise variance. So all these three uh, functions are, are, are piecewise smooth and uh, and uh, with a uh, potentially finite number of these continuity gems. And uh, this basically captures the spatial dependence of the brain signal and uh, uh, because the um, Green activity may appear differently in different type of brain tissue. The white matter, green matter, they actually have different uh, intrinsic properties and. Uh, uh, and also, we believe, uh, especially for the beta of S, we believe the uh, not an order covariance is going to strongly associated with uh, brain activity on all the regions, right? So we, we, we assume there's some sparsity there that is actually on the beta of S. And, uh, um, and also, we believe the uh, signal is uh, not, all, not, uh, not just a single voxel has a spike signal. They potentially have a spatial clustering. And, uh, but, but that assumption can, can potentially be relaxed. And, uh, uh, and also, we, we uh, here is a, a little bit strong assumption that we, we assume there's non-zero effect. If you assume beta is non-zero, then the, the, there's some lower bound there that cannot be too close to, to zero. So basically, we cannot detect a two-way signal here. Yeah. So, so with this three assumption, yes. Good question. So between these different individuals, do the voxel need to be aligned? I mean, yeah. Yeah, so in, 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 in brain imaging analysis, we, we, we make that assumptions that all the, uh, all the brain image are registered to a standard brain template. But that is uh, uh, definitely a strong assumption, but all the brain imaging, we do the pre-processing steps and make this align, alignment and compatible across different, uh, different subjects. But that is a pre-processing step. In this model, we do not handle that, yeah. Um, but that's a very good point. They have to be aligned, and we, we, can, we can talk about that compatible. So, uh, we have some some work uh, has been uh, uh, going on like try to relax that assumption like automatically do the do the alignment, but that's need a, a different generating model like how to actually uh, uh, sort of like mimic this situation. You have a misalignment issue. Uh, so, yes. Yes. So when you're considering the voxels, you're talking about voxels. You're considering the entire brain image altogether. You're considering specific 
regions of interest is. Uh, we, we were really considering in power brain imaging. So yeah, that, that, yeah. yeah, so that's when you're seeing the total number of all things you're considering. Right, right. The total number of also here uh, in, in our application is around 200,000 walks, for example. Right. Yeah, that's the that's so, total number of, uh, with respect to the yeah. accumulated all the, the cumulative addition of all the regions of interest in, together, all the walks. Right, right, right. And uh, we define the, we basically have a standard green template. We define the coordinate system there. And uh, our inference can inference a higher resolution. So if you observe the data on the lower resolution, but we, we can infer any location in that standard green template as a kind of inference on a higher resolution. Uh, yes. Yeah. In the earlier block, you mentioned the neural imaging between spatial temporal data, right? Yeah. And, but I think the model, I did not see the time index. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. So. Here, well, I, I just uh, uh, do illustration that I use the S as a generic notation, like the spatial location. You can actually add a temporal, the fourth dimension here for the for the general analysis. But uh, uh, we also have the method particular handle the time. So if you if you if you do the time, and it's not simply just the fourth dimension of space, they can they have order there. Then we have some like a uh, uh, sort of like a. Uh, uh, longitudinal type of model, like uh, you can actually model this. But uh, but uh, in, in this application, we try to uh, uh, for the for the application, we try to uh, do some pre-processing. For example, for the fMRI study, we usually we usually come up some uh, imaging summary statistics from the uh, four D data to the three D data. So basically, at each location, we fit a general regression uh, and uh, regress out the, the the stimulus pattern. We basically get the summary statistics for each voxel. So the, the, the data input here uh, in, in, in our one of the application, we basically just focus on 3D data. We do not take into account the temporal correlation right now. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah, the, uh, those are all very good questions. I, I, I just give a lot of details and then, then we all catch that. So uh, so the, 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 the key point here is that we, uh, first, we, this model is different from regular like random effects uh, or mixed effects model that uh, they assume the individual effect that follow random, uh, is a random process. And we will, we will claim that this is a, a, a fixed a deterministic function. We can estimate, so first we, we show this is identifiable uh, under certain condition that uh, basically we need this condition that uh, the design matrix X uh, transpose the R of S uh, should be orthogonal to each other. So basically we define the, the, uh, the, the parameter space need to, you know, based on this X, I. Uh, the, the design matrix. So uh, that, given, that, uh, given that assumption that you actually can recover the R of S uh, deterministic, otherwise you, you, if there's an information overlap, you basically cannot actually uh, identify R of S. And uh, uh, with this assumption that we can actually try to uh, using um, into more networks to estimate all those parameters of interest. So the, 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 the idea here is that we're trying to uh, um, because the you neural know, imaging data has a very large uh, spatial locations, right? So that we try to consider how to use spatial locations as sample size for the deep neural network. It's not necessarily you can use an, uh, the number of subjects as a, as a training sample size. So in this model, you actually can do that. So, so we, we, we basically approximate the spatial value coefficients uh, all the spatial value coefficients in the model as, a, as a neural networks and input just uh, spatial coordinates. So the spatial coordinates, if you do 2D image, that only x, y. If you do 3D image, that will x, y, z. And if you do spatial temporal, you have x, y, z and the time points. So that, that, that input dimension is very small here. So it's not a very large input dimension. But the output here is uh, the uh, coefficients in the model. So if you in the model, you see we have a J, capital J, different beta regression coefficient. We right? so have a new effect alpha. And so uh, uh, capital N uh, alpha and also have the one uh, spatially varying uh, variance. Basically you have this, all those parameters. And, uh, and we want to also do uh, another uh, level of like interpretation. We impose the, the stability on the, on the uh, beta and uh, alpha. Basically we believe uh, uh, some brain, uh, only part of the brain region uh, have a, a non-zero effect. And uh, then we actually uh, just uh, carefully design the output layer of the neural network. We use this sort of uh, hard stretch coding kind of operator on the, on the output of neural network. So, so basically you, you given any locations, uh, then you actually 
呃 ，at input of the neural network, you have output will be the dimensional of the capital J plus n plus one. So you have output will be all those coefficient, and uh, we have this operator as a uh, non-special operator. So potentially you can get all those data. Uh, uh, e equal to zero or non-zero, it depends on whether it's not the hard square shooting operator. So you automatically accuse the positive here. So, and uh, you don't need uh, any uh, sort of like uh, uh, regularization here to achieve the positive. So basically using its hard square shooting and uh, like no, no one automatically to learn it. So, and, uh, and, uh, so, and also you can join and learn all the parameters simultaneous, basically. So, and, uh, and then this is uh, the, the key idea here. And we, we do not need to uh, use a very fancy neural network. We're just using feed forward, like a deep neural network, like uh, probably uh, for those of you are familiar with that, it's basically it's a, a nasty uh, a linear transformation pl uh, and plug in these uh, activation function, nonlinear uh, activation function. So, and, uh, and the, the advantage here, we summarize a few, uh, uh, a few advantages in, in this model, we basically, Neural network can actually capture the heterogeneity shapes and uh, uh, smoothness. So we will show some like a uh, uh, similar similar data set. You see, we can we do not need to uh, assume that there is uh, homogeneity smoothness in the in activation pattern. You can have a very very sharp change or gradually smooth on the same same region or or or, 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 or close uh, close by. And uh, and uh, uh, also we have the. Uh, we want to interpret the, the results as the output of neural network, right? So we interpret the, because the, the, the output of neural network is the coefficient of our interest in the statistical model. So I'm trying to sort of, sort of interpret that as the output of neural network instead of interpret any weight parameter or pass parameter in this neural network, which is not necessarily identifiable. And uh, we, yes. Uh, I will show that in the next page. Here, I just uh, give you a general summary of uh, the idea here. Yeah. So. Um, and also, uh, we have this, uh, we impose the positive without using any regularization, we're just using this hard stretch holding. And also, we uh, convert this large number of voxels at training sample for the neural network. Uh, but this is a very good point, uh, what is the dialogue function, uh, how you convert that. So, uh, so this is here, uh, here is uh, the overview of the structure, and uh, uh, the idea uh, is, uh, again, so the, uh, here I just have 2D, 2D example, the, the, uh, the, this left panel uh, will be the other observed image, and then we model the observed image as a linear combination of the covariance and those uh, variable coefficients, spatial variable coefficient. And the x, uh, the, the, here could be because we only have the uh, x, y coordinates, uh, x, y, x, two. And then we put, the, we put that into the neural network, and then output will be all those coefficients. And then we, we generate the, uh, even, even the neural network input, then we generate the, the, the data, right? So this is sort of like generating model that you, if you, you know, given spatial locations, given a width of neural network, you actually can split by the whole, whole model. And then you can generate data, basically. So then with naturally, given this, this uh, Python, then you basically can write the loss function. So uh, here we have uh, this three steps estimations. Uh, you can do it iteratively, or you can do the step by step, or just uh, one, uh, one step feature. That's also okay. We, we, we do the experiment and we see the see the benefit uh, from both. But uh, uh, so here, the, the first step, you, you can see we just uh, fit the uh, the main fact the data, right? So you just uh, uh, consider here you can see the loss function we write uh, with respect to the v, v from one to capital with the number of voxels, and and then but with that all the imaging data across subject, right? So the y the bold y is uh, y one to y n, so all the subject at one location. Then look at all the subject at one location, and then using this uh, neural network uh, constructed a uh, very coefficient and times x, and then we can we can measure the the, the approximation. Uh, arrow between uh, at this particular locations across all the n subject, and then we we assume that over over the subject uh, all the locations uh, we basically um, get some of them together for for this loss, and then we minimize the uh, uh, the this loss function and get the uh, estimation of coefficient uh, in the neural network, which which we we do not really care about the estimation of the weights and the bias parameter in the neural network, but I care about the output. Basically, we, we interpret this output as uh, the estimated by spatial value coefficient. So then we just need to study the theoretical properties of this output. It's a sort of like a prediction of neural network instead of study the estimation of the weights and the bias parameter in the neural network. So follow this idea, we, we first get the beta estimation, then we have a, a kind of like a loss function for to get a alpha and uh, also get the, uh, the, the variance parameter as um, 
uh, the uh, yeah the spiritual violence, violence parameters that they step two we get the alpha the individual uh, viral coefficient and the uh, individual effects and uh, also step three we get this uh, violence estimation and then we can uh, so this is just one step estimation so basically you can do the iterative like uh, uh, update and then get a, get a even uh, a more accurate estimation but then take a longer time and until it converge so um, any more questions so far about the estimation. Yes. Are you putting any uh, sparsity, import sparsity on the W matrices in the given input? Uh, I, yeah, that's a very good point. I actually, you, you when you feature the neural network, uh, uh, you, we actually using drop out, drop out a kind of strategy, which is equivalent to impose some sparsity, which is just uh, for the model fitting uh, purpose. But uh, in theory, we we. Well, we just assume we can do the optimization, and we don't need that. But, but in practice, you need that we'll get, get a better performance for sure. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, then we we do, uh, we do some error bound analysis, but the, uh, the 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 fundamental uh, sort of like uh, uh, theory here is not uh, not quite new. It's basically just uh, follow the uh, non parametric regression. You have to do with a neural network to fit a non parametric regression, right? So there are some error bound here. You can follow that. But, uh, but, uh, but we we do that and, and the whole framework. Uh, 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 a different. Uh, Sort of like a uh, contribution here is that we also uh, can show the side consistency, which means that we can uh, show the selection is consistent and the which is uh, uh, probably haven't been uh, derived before. Uh, but in, in terms of these results here, the, uh, we actually uh, decompose this sort of like outbound into three components. One is the estimation, I also basically talk about the, the variance of the estimator, and uh, another is the uh, the approximation arrow that's uh, basically the, the neural network, how, how, uh, how the neural network can approximate the true uh, spatial value coefficient, uh, how, how good it is, and, uh, and uh, also uh, the deviation that's basically uh, the, the, the two main effect induced by arrow estimate the, the, the individual devi deviation. So, so we also, uh, yeah, like I mentioned, we also have this sign arrow bound because we have this policy achieving procedure, we can automatically achieve the sparsity then we actually can show this uh, side consistency um, with uh, with, uh, with slightly different the, the, the R bound, and I actually can give you the uh, uh, sort of theoretical guarantee for the for the activation region detection. So which part of the brain actually uh, truly non zero is that? So here we give, give you some like uh, example. Uh, this is a design a uh, three D example that we we design the tree effect. Uh, uh, purposely have this like uh, a smooth transition or or square shape and a sharp change and uh, and also have like a uh, uh, different uh, uh, size of the spatial clustering of the tree effect. Uh, so you can imagine if you using using regular method like a work kernel method or spline, then you have to have a very spatially adaptive like smoothness parameter to to actually feel this and very hard to search those parameters potentially. And uh, this is just the data effect. Uh, this is just data effect. Uh, we also have these individual effects, and uh, it can be quite different pattern from the beta. And also, we have this uh, our variance can be uh, also quite different, have a different uh, large scale. And if you combine all those things, uh, it's a very hard problem. And also, we we trying to reduce the uh, uh, sample size. We do not uh, uh, have a much larger n the, the number of the images, basically. Uh, so, so th this is a, a kind of give you a few example here that what what's, what we observe the data uh, looks like, and uh, so the goal here is that from those observed data, can you recover all three of those uh, parameters very well? And um, uh, oops. yeah, we compare uh, the performance by different method. Uh, I, I didn't got a chance to review uh, like a several different existing methods, like the, the MUA method with a massive univariate, and that's basically you just uh, for each location you feed a regression, right? So that's a very simple method, and then you can do the when you do selection, you can do the uh, uh, t test, and uh, you do the uh, multiple comparison adjustment. Then you can see this is a uh, uh, very low power; you cannot uh, fairly uh, recover any. Uh, Activation region, and then there are some like a uh, uh, standard uh, called spatial value coefficient model, which proposed by uh, 
some people, some people and Chen Fan in maybe 2014, and the, they have the sort of local polynomial and the kernel uh, estimation uh, on this type of effect. And uh, also, uh, there are some low rank approximation uh, compared with supposedly by, by Le Xin's group, and uh, they, they do this sort of low rank approximation. They cannot uh, barely uh, recover those details, although they can achieve pretty uh, good power. And uh, um, there are some some methods have actually the FPM method is has been widely used, which is a sort of follow up by the MUA method, but they're using quite different sort of like uh, uh, multiple complex control based on learning tool theory. You can see this method, uh, this method is most uh, kind of practically used method, which is a uh, pretty powerful, and you can you can see some some signal there. And um, and also there are some some baseline based method that has been proposed that, that uh, yes. This method, uh, rotation invariant, because sometimes you get the main issue if you do the rotate rate or something. So, can it recover those kind of things? Uh, currently, we assume there's no rotations. Yeah, if it's a rotation, we need to add the add the uh, additional adjustment on that. Yeah. So that, that's a very good point. We 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 uh we, we think about that uh, uh for for a different project. We are trying to work on that. Yeah. So. So and uh, and uh, this is uh, basically the neural imaging uh, estimation, uh, I mean, uh, neural network based uh, estimation, which is uh, can give a uh, pretty pretty good uh, result. You compare with the ground truth, that's quite quite close. And and if you closely look at some some uh, we we do some scale uh, simulations of uh, vary the sort of like signal to ratio, sample size, and the number of pixels, and we compare uh, and also kind of a sort of like a. Uh, you know, Every pair of noise or like a random uh, normal noise, and also compare different method. Then you can see we we track the mean square arrow, the recover the parameter estimation, track the abstraction accuracy, the what's particle rate when the board power, and uh, and, uh, and and if you if you look at this, we we we, we compare like uh, the SSM with the one of the uh, best methods so far, and uh, you can see we we achieved a much better uh, uh, MSE. Especially, you can see when we vary the some uh, the the number of voxels from from sixty four cube to one twenty four cube, and you can see the SSM does not improve much. So that they, they did not borrow the much the the the, the spatial resolution increase. Then, uh, probably the theory will not guarantee that I'm going to improve the accuracy. But uh, in our case, that if you increase the spatial locations, then you will have a much better actually MSE. Basically, you can get a more accurate estimation. You, you best use of the data, and uh, and uh, and similarly, you can see the power. Um, both the FBCM and uh, our method can actually control the force positive rate, but we have a much better power uh, compared with FBCM. And if you compare with some. Um, uh, uh, low rank uh, sparse uh, approximation method, they can uh, achieve a uh, similar power, but uh, they cannot control the force discover uh, for a positive rate because the, the their, their low rank approximation will actually lose the details. Basically, they can select a lot of irrelevant features. And uh, uh, this is uh, uh, basically uh, the simulation results. And we apply this method to different like real neural imaging data set. And here I'll just give you an example for this applied data set I just introduced at the very beginning. Uh, of my talk, and uh, this is a sort of consortium uh, effort that's attracting data from uh, 20 uh, different experimenting uh, uh, sites and uh, around the 1,000 subject. And uh, we uh, look at the um, which degree of network co uh, connectedness, which is to reflect the how how the uh, each brain locations how are connected to other how the, how the strong the signal connected with other lo uh, locations and. Uh, uh, I'm trying to use this as a uh, uh, look at the difference between uh, the uh, different uh, uh, cognitive abilities uh, scores and uh, uh, how that associated with this brain activity. So uh, we we particularly use apply this method to focus on uh, to verify why why our method is better uh, because we're trying to see the selection stability. So if you sort of randomly remove some data or remove some data, you, you focus on just using a, a subset of the uh, experimenting side to do an analysis, whether you are you can have consistent selection of a part of the brain, which is uh, uh, make, uh, make sure you have a, a strong stability on, on the selections. And then we compare with different methods, we find our method can identify the, uh, the uh, uh, part of the view cortex, which is uh, quite a stable that we always can have a better uh, 
kind of like uh, uh, more reproducible selections on that post, uh, uh, part of the region. And uh, we, we have uh, compared with our other methods, our, uh, our method can achieve uh, uh, identify larger those stable regions. And um, yeah, so uh, in summary, for this work, we try to uh, utilize the uh, deep neural network to estimate the parameters in this uh, uh, image on scalar regression, and we can impose a positive result the uh, regularization final term. We use just thresholding operator, and we, we can accommodate our subject heterogeneity and uh, uh, we consider output of neural network as uh, interpretations. And uh, uh, this paper uh, just uh, accepted by JRSB uh, early this year, and uh, we had this uh, uh, package, uh, Python package on my uh, GitHub page, and uh, uh, you are very welcome to try our, our method if you have a, a similar data set to, to an analyze. And uh, this is the, the first uh, uh, topic I want to share. Uh, any questions for this one? This might be a very, very naive question, but um, can you explain how the correlation between the location summit model or how is it captured um, through this uh, framework? Uh, the, the correlation, actually, we do not explicitly model the correlation, spatial correlation. We, we, we model that through the spatial dependence of the individual effects. But uh, given our assumption, we, we do not assume that it's uh, spatially uh, correlated. Basically, we, even the alpha, and the beta, everything is independent, we assume. But they actually can, they can yeah, they can capture that. If you marginalize or integrate out alpha i in the in the model, which is uh, equivalent to uh, accommodate a spatial correlation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Since that you have a separate neural networks for the many main effects and also in many individual effects, and so they are being trained parallelly and at the end connected by the same loss function. Yeah. So it can be quite a few neural networks to train parallelly. So does that create any technical challenge during the implementation when you are trying to train all these networks parallelly? I know that you are using dropout, but apart from dropout, are you using something else? That is helping with the implementation. Yeah, I think uh, uh, this is a very good point. So, for a very large data set, for example, we have 200,000 voxels and we have, for example, uh, thousand of subjects. So, in that case, you uh, if you we do this uh, three step procedure, we can uh, naturally parallel the, the, the model fitting. And you, you, you definitely can do the joint estimation, but that needs to iterative update. That can require a lot of memories. We compare for the small scale simulation, we compare the performance. The, the point update or the reason update will achieve a slightly better result that take a much longer time to, to, to do the analysis. So in practice, we, we, we go with this like a, a parallel uh, kind of implementations. Yeah. So when you are doing the parallel implementation, does the network share with or like all these networks, they don't share any noise? They don't share. They don't share noise. So this is a separate analyzer. They do, do not do any communication. Yeah. Yes. So for stochastically varying coefficient models, uh, it's much more easy to, you know, develop correlation between the coefficients. Uh, what I realized from here that, uh, you know, the, the individual coefficients, varying coefficients, have, you know, correlation has been put on them, right, in the, in the modern development stage. So I was wondering how hard or how easy it is to extend this model. Yeah, so I I think the the challenge part is when you have the spatial correlations uh, in the noise term, for example, the, the epsilon. Uh, that's great. The two things. One thing is from the identifiability issue. That it, so it's just like you have a normal data, you cannot join the estimate mean and the variance simultaneously if you only have the one observation. So you have to make some assumption that uh, you are uh, potentially you have some like a uh, uh, metric assumption on the spatial uh, dependence, and it's, it can. You cannot depend too fast, then in that case, potentially you can estimate that, but that creates a challenge on your loss function. So you need to account for spatial dependence to create a loss function, which is uh, which is not uh, uh, simpler as what we currently assume, like just a data summation over uh, different voxels. You have to do the uh, sort of like a, a weighted summation or like a, a matrix uh, inverse version of the summation, something like that, that which is uh, which is doable, but uh, just uh, computationally uh, not feasible for our case currently. Yeah. Uh, 
But, but on the other hand, I, I agree that uh, uh, this model will now currently uh, maybe suffer the, if you have a, a spatial collision in the noise, this model may, may not suffer uh, the, uh, the the accuracy. Yeah, so accuracy may decrease. Yeah, yes? Uh, can you clarify the technical assumption that the number of discount communities uh, spatially in your coefficients is finite? Uh, because um, indexed by a single dimension, I guess that makes sense that you have individual regions where you have discontinuity, so different points. But uh, spatially, it seems to suggest that you can't model like uh, smooth regions, like ones that aren't reducible to a finite digital product as well. So it's like, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is a very yeah, this is a very good point. This basically will assume the the true coefficient has some structure can be can be uh, uh rewrite as a finite number of the piecewise smooth functions yes, and block, 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 block. yeah, any type of shapes, but uh, but it, it has to be a finite number, so there exists uh, some partitions. Yeah, this is uh, our technical assumption. Yeah. Yes. Can you briefly comment on how do you use SDD to train a neural nets where you have this fast thresholding? Do you use some of continuous relaxation of the fast thresholding function? Oh yeah. So there are some like uh, approximation of the fast thresholding function, and uh, and uh, we. Uh, we we try, we have that it's not a very sensitive to the choice of that, but basically you can one 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 good approximation would be a dependent function to the this thresholding procedure. Yeah. Yes. Yes, the thresholding parameter also estimated. Yeah. There are some identifiability there, so you can you can find a different threshold parameter. So threshold is also spatially varying. No, threshold is not. Oh. Threshold is constant, but uh, we still have some. We, you can see some shift, but uh, but we we do not care about the thresholding estimation. We just care about the final re results. Yeah. All right. Thank you all for the good questions. So. Then the next one we we, we probably uh, talk about the uh, briefly talk about the, the the other idea how we actually using deep neural network to to do the scalar on image regression, which is uh, uh, slightly different uh, uh, kind of like a use of the neural network. So uh, here the the goal here is uh, 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 by this joint work with my uh, former. Uh, Postdoc, uh, who is currently at the uh, University of China and also a visiting student from Duke, uh, and. Uh, uh, so the, the general framework here is that we want to uh, develop a general framework for this scalar on image regression. Basically, the idea here is that we we have the scalar outcome, for example, disease status or like uh, uh, or general cognitive ability, for example, and we are trying to use imaging predictors uh, to make prediction on that. And also want to understand which part of the brain uh, associated with that, right? So so the, 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 the natural simple uh, idea will be to consider this imaging data as a, uh, as a uh, individual predictors over uh, over so then you can use a linear regression, right? So you can do the level selection, do linear regression. And uh, uh, the, the key point here is how you how you relax to, uh, I mean, utilize the spatial location, the first point, uh, how to utilize spatial locations that uh, are actually uh, quite related to imaging data, and also how to uh, model this uh, non-linear, uh, uh, non linearity. So basically, this association not necessarily that simple as a linear association. There are some non linear association here. So the 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 general framework will say basically, if you rewrite this as a sort of like a, uh, you consider an imaging predictor as sort of functional predictor, just uh, evaluate at different observed locations. So uh, depends on how you, how you specify the, uh, the the imaging resolution. Basically, you also observe a set of spatial locations, right? So and uh, and uh, um, and then you you, you basically uh, you can consider uh, I mean, uh, like a generalized linear model where you assume the conditional density of a uh, y given x and follow exponential family. Basically, you can write a uh, write, write the model as uh, as this. We 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 here we we just for the uh, data analysis purpose, we want to adjust a, a set of nonlinear predictors. But the key point here, we we model the entire imaging uh, uh, as a as an input of the function operator. So basically, you need to define a function operator. This is the most general uh, framework. You define a function operator on the image, right? So that's basically, and then you you, you, you consider this function operator, uh, the input will be a function. The xi is the function, basically. And also, the, the input also the location. So the function observed at which resolution, right? So you can, you actually, potentially, you can have a, Different resolution for different image, but uh, in this framework, we just assume all of them uh, observed on the same 
same resolution. So, um, but this framework can be potentially relaxed that uh, because we have such data set that you may have a different resolution from different subjects, but you also can can can, can make this assets or locations uh, kind of subject specific. But here, to uh, I mean, as a very first uh, model, uh, we we just assume that's the same uh, uh, at current point. So. Then we, we the, the idea is that how you actually estimate this function operator. Basically, this is a bivariate operator. It's a, a well, first into this imaging predictor is a function. Another will be set of spatial locations, and uh, and we, we give the uh, so this is a challenge problem. You can imagine that if you have uh, as I mentioned uh, the imaging predictor, uh, we have a uh, uh, two hundred thousand voxels. So the, basically, this is uh, the, the function operator, but uh, uh, you observe it on on two hundred thousand voxels. So that will be our input. And then output will be the scalar, right? So that will be the uh, real, real number. And uh, those uh, functional, uh, those imaging data appear the spatial temporal dependence and uh, and also the, the imaging data uh, appears simplicity. So basically for, for some image value, you, you do not have any signals. So, and uh, and also how to model the nonlinear association. So, um, we do the try that would be uh, how to incorporate the spatial locations and uh, we can, uh, define a sort of single layer spatial evaluate weight in your network. So, and uh, the idea will be actually quite a, quite a simple that you start from the uh, single layer neural, neural network and then do the linear combination of all these uh, 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 imaging predictor observed at those locations, right? So, and uh, you have uh, the, the only difference here is that in, in the regular single, uh, Single layer neural network, you don't have this spatial location here. So here we add the spatial location here, but this becomes your weight parameter becomes the spatially varying weight parameters. So you can consider your weight parameter as a, as actually a spatially varying function. So instead of you have a set of the uh, weights uh, for each input of your uh, uh, x, and uh, here you you consider you have an unknown function, right? And an unknown function, spatially varying function as a as a weight of these. Uh, um, uh, X uh, imaging predictor. So, uh, and with this framework, we definitely can do multi-layer uh, neural network. So, but the key point here is that we just uh, uh, using the input layer to in incorporate the spatial uh, information. You can do more layer without with or without incorporate spatial location. So, we in our uh, all the numerical example, we try multi-layer, but we, we do not incorporate the uh, spatial information in the higher layer. We only incorporate spatial information in the first layer. And uh, and uh, uh, here we have some like a uh, uh, re restriction here. The uh, we we try to make sure we 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 normalize the summation of the weighted average of the imaging signal, and then and then we we basically try to make sure the total effects of the imaging prediction effect without uh, increase as uh, the total amount of the intensity you observe contribute to the prediction, not not as resolution change has increased, right? So if resolution goes to infinity, you will not expect this, this total uh, average will go to infinity as well. So we have this rescaling factor, but in practice, uh, it doesn't really matter. It's more like the constant uh, shift. But this is more like for the theoretical analysis that you, if you allow your resolution goes to infinity, you will have a better uh, sort of prediction power. And uh, yeah, and uh, we actually, for this work, we are trying to, uh, uh, and I'll make inference from Bayesian perspective. So it's a uh, right, we try to derive the uh, uh, prior model for for this uh, spatially varying neural network. So basically, you can consider this is a special non-parametric regression problem. Your input, uh, no matter regular Euclidean vectors, is a it's an imaging operator and the spatial locations. And then uh, what what will be if you do the Bayesian analysis, what will be the suitable prior for this? For this unknown function operator. So here we define this sort of spatially varying neural network operator, and then we, we assume the uh, uh, this is basically is a is a exactly just a single layer neural network construction, but we assume that the the, the, the spatially varying way to follow a thresholded Gaussian process, which is uh, can impose piecewise smoothness sparsity and uh, uh, and the spatial clustering on this uh, very efficient and also uh, just a, a sign normal file for those uh, those parts and other lead parameters. So so uh, the spatial uh, the sort of shooting Gaussian process actually has been applied to the regular like a linear regression assumption uh, for the scalar image regression. Uh, this is our earlier work and uh, it actually can achieve this uh, uh, SMS sparse as as far as function and make a inference and uh, uh, have some theoretical guarantee. And uh, uh, 
And here we basically extend that, but we, 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 we want to uh, have this general concept about the uh, like a file for this uh, functional operator. And uh, and we, we, we study some properties that uh, um, for, for basically for a wide range of apps. I, I did not uh, uh, put the definition of app here, but app is sort of like all the all the potential possible uh, true function, true function operators. But it definitely, we, we need some assumption on how that uh, uh, there's uh, some sparsity uh, smoothness assumption regarding to this functional space. And uh, 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 it's a very complicated notation that I just skip here. And uh, but, but the, the point here is that if we using this neural network, we can show that it's actually uh, have a larger support. Basically, you have a very positive probability constant to now arbitrary small neighborhood of any true functions uh, for consideration, just using this uh, single layer uh, spatially varying uh, neural network operator. And then we can we can establish that posterior consistency and also the, the selection consistency, which is important. This is sort of non-linear non function variable selection problem that you, you better you select a particular on the brain region that actually, actually related to the um, predictors. So, so uh, and and here are some like poor examples. I, I just want to briefly uh, mention that this is a, a, a like a, a very basic uh, like a, a deep neural, uh, deep learning course. Maybe you can uh, help you if you took a deep neural network course. Even by this data set before, there are some tens of the uh, machine learning method has been used this to try to uh, make prediction on the. Uh, um, uh, and written digits. And here we, we, we emphasize on selection. Uh, uh, Sort of like a illustration. Then this is not the best example, but but it's more like give you some sense that we can identify some region that, for example, you just distinguished four and seven. We can identify some region, and we we only look at those regions. We can make a very accurate prediction. We don't need to look at the whole picture, basically subset of the picture. So, um, and if, if you do regular Bayesian neural network, you will not identify those those region very well, and the prediction accuracy is not very good. But the whole point here is that we. Uh, we want to do very small sample size because we need the neural image application. The, the dimension of the image and the versus the, the, the actual number of image observed is actually a huge, a huge ratio. And in this case, we have two twenty-eight by twenty-eight image. But what if we only have like ten, ten are like a training data set? So, uh, and our method actually can achieve much better. Uh, performance compared with the state of art, the neural network method. So this is the key point here is that we can reduce the uh, number of image and we sort of follow spatial information and uh, can uh, also account for this nonlinear non association and uh, uh, build a more accurate uh, prediction. And and uh, we uh, we also have this uh, application for this uh, uh, ABCD study, more recent study. And then the goal here, we are trying to uh, using uh, functional uh, uh, FMI, uh, functional data, uh, task FMI data, and uh, to make prediction on the general cognitive ability, basically it's more objective assessment of the, uh, the, the IQ score. So, and uh, and uh, uh, we are trying, here we're using the working memory task. So basically the, the, the give the sequence of the video uh, kind of, uh, and or pictures that are trying to uh, ask the, the subjects uh, whether they recall the, uh, the very beginning of the picture was like a two picture ahead. So basically that's a, High load or, or, or low load memory kind of like task, and uh, we, we basically using this uh, uh, imaging predictor, and we trying to see how much variability we can explain, right? So, and we uh, we compare with all these state of art like a convolutional neural network and other like uh, 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 Bayesian neural network, and uh, we we find our method can achieve uh, best uh, prediction accuracy in, in in terms of the uh, the predictive R square. They can explain more like the probability of IQ based on our method, and the important. Uh, 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 result here is more like we, we, we actually only select a very subset of the brain region. We don't need to look at the whole brain. So based on our analysis, we only identify a few like a subset of the voxel from these 200,000 voxels. We only look at uh, those uh, those uh, voxels from those brain regions. So we can actually uh, identify the important regions. We only use those and plug into our our model because we have this sparsity in in the in the regression coefficient. We identify those regions, so we don't need to look at the whole brain, and we can make that prediction. We compare with all current state of art, like a convolutional neural network, the, the input has to be the whole brain uh, uh, image, and they take a much longer time to run compared with our method. Okay, so uh, and we identify several like important region which is uh, potentially related to the uh, interpretation, like uh, like a big, 
based on the, the cognitive science uh, uh, knowledge that is matched with their uh, like uh, brain, brain uh, 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 functions like a memory retrieval, uh, task control, and uh, deep mode network. So in summary, for this work, we are trying to uh, like uh, define a neural network uh, to uh, import spatial information and then try to study some some strategic property for this general neural network method. And uh, and we uh, I haven't talked about the conceptual machine, but we we basically just using stochastic gradient uh, long domain dynamic long domain method, and uh, we can uh, do the posterior inference uh, efficiently, and uh, we. We had, uh, uh, yeah, so the, the first paper was uh, for this uh, spatial radical uh, for, for data image, we, we use a linear model is in, in metric uh, several years ago, but uh, uh, later we had this paper found that it's under revision for the journal machine learning research. And this is my uh, second topic. I don't have time to find a topic, but uh, any questions? Uh,